So I haven't really done like a higher level software video in a while or like drawn out diagrams. So I figured I'd try to do that in this video. One of the things I wanted to kind of talk about that's been on my mind is what is availability? What is high availability? There's various terms you may have seen in this industry. Maybe you haven't seen them. Like for example, what is nine nines? What is a highly available system? What is a service level agreement? Okay, so let's, let's start with the service level agreement. I got Amazon over here, type in Lambda. And they have these like weird things about like uptimes, right? So 99.95, but greater than or equal to 99.0. They're saying basically if for whatever reason they go below this availability agreement with you all, that they will give you like a 10% credit percentage, okay? So this is one example of a hosting service talking about availability. They're 99.95 and they kind of talk about like what will happen if they go below 95% then they will owe you 100% of like your credits or something. You have to look into the fine print. I haven't really looked into it. But what does 95% uptime percentage mean? If you go to this high availability, let's find 99.5. That means that downtime per year, they can only have 1.8 days, right? So if their system is down for more than 1.8 days, technically they have to come back and reimburse you for something. I don't know what they reimburse you for, or like what, what the credits mean. Um, Maybe it's for every day that they're down, they're going to give you 100% credits. Same thing with Vercel. Let's look at Vercel. All hosting services typically or should have a service level agreement. You read through this and they will say, we will make a reasonable effort to give you nine, or give you four nines. Okay, so let's look at what four nines mean. We're going to go over here. Four nines means they can only be down for 52 minutes out of the year. Now, I, I, I'm pretty sure Vercel had an outage that was much longer than an hour. I'm pretty sure AWS has had shortages, uh, outages that have lasted much longer than um, a total of this much days. So you have to kind of like read through here and try to figure out like what happens if a service were to breach that service level agreement. Typically, they figure out ways to give you some free credits, right? They give you some free compute where you can kind of make up those lost days. So I just want to kind of touch on some of those terms just to make sure that my, my audience knows what this stuff is, because it is kind of important. Sometimes you might be put on a project, and I think this is more for like critical, mission critical systems or like government projects where they actually state that if you're going to build us this system, if you want to win this contract, you have to guarantee us that you're going to have four nines uptime, or you're going to have five nines uptime. Now, as you go down this list, like nine nines, let's be honest, like, you have to be an excellent engineer and you have to make sure that everything is like perfectly planned out to only be down for 31 milliseconds out of the year. But I believe there's systems out there that are engineered in such a way that they can actually achieve nine nines uptime. Because as you get more into this lower tier, you have to figure out different ways to basically make sure that your systems are never down. When you do deployments, you have to make sure that you don't have to bring anything down to do a new version update. So let's go over the diagramming real quick and let's kind of talk about how some projects can potentially achieve high availability. Now, I, I can't say where in this bracket I have actually built this system with. Um, the system I work on at work, I feel like we don't have much downtime. Uh, we do a blue-green deployment setup, so we always have a system that's running. And then when we deploy a new version, we just basically route traffic over to the new version. Um, but since we do host on AWS, we've had outages, which means that basically we can only guarantee that our uptime is going to match what, you know, whenever AWS decides to crash. So I think the best way to talk about this is let's just talk about the most basic way to host a service, right? You have a VM here. If I make a user down here, we got a little user. He's going to be trying to access your, your web server. Maybe it's an API. Maybe it's hosting like your front end. Maybe you're using PHP or something. But there's risk involved with this, right? The VM, under the hood, you have to do security updates. You have to do patches. Typically, on the VM, you have running services. Um, the VM has, you know, a certain amount of memory on it. Maybe on the VM, you have some type of, like, file storage or disk storage, which has a capacity. Now, this works pretty well, um, but there's a lot of risk involved with this because if a bunch of users were to try to connect to your VM at the same time, your service could be overwhelmed and it could crash. You could end up using all the memory on the machine. You could somehow fill up the disk usage on that VM, which caused the entire machine to fail. The machine itself is made up of physical memory and CPU and hard disk. If those were to physically fail, if your memory were to fry, your CPU were to fry, the whole VM goes away, right? So that means you have downtime. So one way to kind of mitigate that risk is you have 
two of these, or you have multiples of these, you could have three or four or five of these, and in front of them, you have a load balancer. Okay, so now, instead of your users being dependent on connecting directly to that VM, they hit a load balancer, and the load balancer is smart enough to know that, hey, if for whatever reason I can't reach this VM, I'm going to go ahead and just route that traffic. I'm going to mark this thing as dead. Just go ahead and draw like a line over here. Say, oh, this one is out of commission. And we're going to go ahead and just route all traffic to either this one or this one. So now if we zoom out a little bit, remember that we are hosting these servers in various data centers that are located in various regions of the world. And between these regions, for example, if this is like the east coast of the United States, you could potentially have a catastrophic event, which the data center burns down. This has actually happened for some data centers. They burn down. And that means if even if you did a load balancer and you have all these VMs that are in that data center, you still lose all that. So you have downtime. You have no systems backed up. There's nothing going on. So all those services go down and you have to figure out a way to bring those back up. Now, if you're the type of person who's like SSHing into machines um, and for whatever reason, you know, that server burned down, you're going to have a lot more work to do to get another machine set up, which is why you want to use like infrastructure as code and have your entire deployment pipeline basically be a click of a button so that if for whatever reason you have to spin up an entire system, you can press a button and bring that up in another region. So what do you do to mitigate this potential risk? Let's say the data center burns down. Well, what happens is typically every region, for example, on AWS, you will have something called availability zones. So you might have multiple data centers that are all kind of close together inside of that region. Let's say this is like the East Coast. I know this diagram sucks. So let's pretend again, this is the United States. I know it's like super abstract and some people can't think in abstracts, but this is the United States and this is the East Coast side of the United States. Inside the East region, you'll have availability zones where they'll have like multiple data centers that are kind of in that region in case for whatever reason, something were to happen. Again, a catastrophic flood, an event, the, con the generators are not working, power goes out and that whole zone goes down. You can have basically some type of routing in front of that. So if I have the user, the user basically knows how to route between one of these regions inside that zone. Now, most of this stuff is like kind of abstracted away. Like if you're using like AWS RDS, you just set up like availability zones. It'll replicate your data to these different zones. Um, and then that is all kind of taken care of behind the scenes. But if you wanted to increase the availability and also the performance of your system, what you do is you end up using another region in a different location, right? So for the West Coast. And then in front of that, you're going to have some type of like DNS routing so that if for whatever reason, this entire East region is just not working, your users are going to route over to a completely different region. Okay, so this is another step of mitigating risk in case something were to go catastrophically wrong in a region of the United States or for whatever reason, um, Amazon can't serve anything from the East. You want to fall back all users to the West Coast. Um, now, typically what you also have is you have like a database that is going to be living in these various regions. Let me go ahead and clean this up a little bit. It's looking kind of dirty. And those databases are going to be replicated, right? So usually, depending on the type of database you're using, you're using like a NoSQL database versus like a, a SQL database. Usually there's like a, a main database and you'll have replicas, all right? So most people will write to a main database and behind the scenes, it'll just kind of replicate that data to various databases across the globe so that if for whatever reason something goes down, users can still start accessing and reading and writing to another database in a different region or uh, availability zone. So that leads me to two terms I want to kind of mention. There's active, active, and there's active, passive. So these are two strategies that your systems can take. Like I mentioned before, active, active is typically you have like a bunch of running systems and you have some type of like load balancer in front of them so that users are distributed amongst all those machines. And if for whatever reason one of those machines were to go down, um, everything's still fine, right? You still have a bunch of backups that are running and it can handle the extra load and requirements that your users may be putting on it. There's also another term called active passive. So this is different from active active where this one is never actually accessed by users. It's just sitting there, it's on standby, it's running, but it doesn't accept any traffic. And if for some reason this load balancer can no longer take you know, can't reach the service over here, it's going to go ahead and kind of take that out of commission and it's going to change its routing table a little bit. 
and it's going to use that new passive setup. So again, I'm not an expert at this stuff. So if there's something that I said wrong, be sure to leave a comment and point it out. Um, or if you just have a lot of knowledge in this stuff, I think leaving a comment would just help other people really understand better ways to build highly available systems. Now, like I mentioned before, there is a cost associated with trying to squeeze out as many nines as possible, right? Building a system that has 95% uptime is probably going to be much cheaper to build and maintain than building a system that requires uh, four nines uptime, okay? So keep that in mind and really think about the trade-offs. Is it really worth having all of these engineers try to really figure out a way so that we can't have more downtime than four days out of the year? Those are some questions that you and management need to think about. And probably on larger systems like, you know, amazon.com, this is where you have to figure out ways to never have downtime because for every second you're down, that could be hundreds, thousands, millions of dollars that you're losing out on for customers. Now, if you are interested in learning more about this stuff, I think the key term you want to look for is site reliability engineering. These are people whose job is to figure out ways to make highly reliable and scalable software systems as stated here. So if that's kind of something that you're interested in, um, definitely go check that out. Go read about it. Go study it. I think this would be something really cool that I would personally be interested in learning more about. But again, I'm just a full stack engineer and I kind of just dabble in learning about this stuff on the side. So that's all I want to share with you all. Hopefully you learned one new thing from watching me babble and draw out diagrams. If you did, leave me a thumbs up. And like always, I have a Discord channel. You guys are welcome to join if you want to kind of hang out and ask questions or just talk to some other engineers. Have a good day and happy coding.